So we're very pleased to welcome back Gary Kelly. This is Gary's 10th appearance speaking to the Wings Club. Each one better than the, the previous, I'm told. And the first one was good. So each year, uh, his list of accomplishments continues to grow. Gary is now in his 31st year at Southwest, where he serves as chairman and the board and chief executive officer. Under Gary's leadership, Southwest has grown to become the nation's largest airline in terms of originating domestic passenger carriage. The company is also celebrating a remarkable 44 years of consecutive profitability. Southwest Airlines is consistently listed as one of Fortune Magazine's most admired companies in the world. Gary has also personally received numerous awards and recognitions. As you know, at our recent annual gala in October, it was our pleasure to honor Gary with the 2017 Wings Club Distinguished Achievement Award. Please join me uh, in welcoming Gary Kelly. Gary. As I said, for today's interview sessions, we're very pleased to have Peter Greenberg with us. Peter is the travel editor for CBS News and appears on CBS This Morning. He produces and co-hosts the Royal Tour television series on PBS. He also hosts the nationally syndicated Peter Greenberg Worldwide Radio Show. I'm hoping that we don't have an investigation breakout in the middle of all this, but I will note that Peter has won multiple Emmys for his investigative reporting and producing. So welcome, Peter, and come on up. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Gary. Good afternoon, Peter. Gary and I actually share one thing in common, among other things, and the one thing we, we share in common is back in 1972, about a year after Southwest started, I was a correspondent for Newsweek based in Houston, and Gary was uh, looking at going to college. At that point, I think they were recruiting you for Rice University, and that's when we first flew Southwest Airlines. On my flight, the ticket was $22, and as I got off the flight, they gave every passenger a fifth of Chivas Regal. <laughs> and my response to that was, this airline is never going to make it. <laughs> Gary was flying, uh, looking at university, they were recruiting you at Rice for football. Right. How many people were on your flight? Uh, w including me, three. <laughs> <laughs> so Gary had the same response. Yeah, the same response. We were wrong, Peter. We were wrong. We were wrong. And here we are. Here we are. All right. Here's the question, though. One of the words in our lexicon these days we, it's inevitable, we can't, avo we can't avoid it, is disruption. Um, we see it in politics, we see it in economics, we see it in natural disasters, we certainly have seen it in the airline business. How are you handling the disruption right now? Because the airlines as a whole right now are doing pretty well, right? I mean, not always the case. Where do you see yourself going forward? You just had, a, you know, you back-to-back -back storms, which, what, a $100 million impact on your bottom line right. and other airlines' bottom lines. Uh, you're now flying internationally, something that you never did before. Uh, next year, you're spreading your wings to your dream location, Hawaii, right? That's right. So, where do you, I mean, does it get to the point where it, the airline might become too big? Well, you know, sort of thinking uh, about your question in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, th there are events that are unforeseen that happen. And over 46 years, of course, Southwest has faced a, a lot of, of challenges. So it just argues that given that we're capital intensive, we're very cyclical, labor intensive, energy intensive, on and on and on, uh, you just have to be as prepared as possible for the unexpected. And 2017 is a perfect example of that. We've had a great year. We deployed a new reservation system, a new Boeing 737 uh, version for the first time in 20 years. And then we had all of these uh, storms that, as you said, you know, uh, cost us 100 million bucks. And we still had a very handsome profit for the quarter. So we try our best to have shock absorbers in place, to be prepared for the unexpected, so that we can continue to take care of our people, uh, serve our customers well and then hopefully uh, produce uh, great returns for our shareholders. Um, <clears throat> right now, uh, times are pretty good, as you said. In fact, um, in many ways, I think one would argue that they have never been better for the airline industry. It won't always be this way, and I think we need to be wise about how we invest today uh, and how we grow, because we shouldn't just extrapolate into perpetuity. 
that things are going to be like this. Well, one of your competitors, Doug Parker, had a great, very interesting quote the other day. You know the quote. I know we're the never going to lose money again. Pretty bold statement. It's, it's uh, very bold. I'm not going to be that bold. <laughs> uh, I think American might lose money again. That was a joke. <laughs> oh, people. But uh, Doug is a great friend of mine. I think he's done a magnificent job uh, leading America West, U.S. Airways, and now American, the largest airline in the world. So I have every respect for him. But it's just, it's just in the end, none of us are in control. And I think um, we're very proud of the fact that we have a very flamboyant marketing persona uh, and employees who really work hard to serve our customers well. But when it comes to the financial side of the business, we're very conservative. We have a very strong balance sheet. We intend to keep it that way, keep our costs low, because in the end, that's the best shock absorber for these kinds of unexpected uh, events. Well, one of those shock absorbers where you guys were ahead of the curve in, in fuel hedging a long time ago. You were prepared. We were prepared. I mean, it's, again, another great example. And it may be the single biggest um, strength that we had in the 2000s as oil was going from 20 to 150, $147 a barrel. Um, it just allows one to uh, gather themselves uh, and have the time to make adjustments to deal with a new reality. And so, uh, you know, the way we view fuel hedging uh, is unchanged. It's a program that I think ought to stay for a century, if not longer. Uh, the biggest mistake a company can make, in my opinion, is to get in, get out, get in, get out. Um, and I've, I've shared with this uh, group before, I liken it to rainfall insurance for ranchers. And uh, you have the insurance in place, you're obviously not hoping for a drought, but if it comes, your crops are covered. And uh, I think the same applies here in aviation with fuel. Now, from a passenger perspective, uh, you know, you see a situation where every other carrier that I know is charging for bags, they're charging for, t for ticket change fees, which start at $200 and go up from there. Uh, you have branded your entire company around the idea that you're not, and uh, stock analysts might look at that and say, oh, Gary, you're leaving about $750 million on the table. And I think that we have, uh, first of all, we have a different view uh, of that, uh, but I think we've, we've, we've convinced uh, our uh, Wall Street uh, investors that, uh, in fact, that's not the case. But uh, I love the fact that our competitors are doing something different than we are. Uh, it's not what we want to aspire to be. We want to be, uh, we want to offer uh, trust with our customers. Uh, we've got a transparency campaign underway uh, to uh, underscore that. And we want fans as customers. Um, they're experiencing our product as we're making it, and we want to make the travel experience as pleasant as possible and certainly take out the kinds of uh, surprises that cost people money. Well, you talk about transparency. The transparency issue just was you know, brought up to the surface this week with the DOT re you know, basically getting back on the original rule that was passed in the Obama administration in the last days of that about how you display fares. Right. I think there's a lot of opportunities still uh, the Jason Van Eaton and I work on with uh, our trade association with uh, the, the regulators on how things can be improved, but we can work with it either way. I mean, the fact of the matter is customers hate these fees, and they hate surprises, and at the same time, consumers are smart. They figure this stuff out over time, uh, and the Internet just provides easy access to go uh, online and do research. So uh, people know that Southwest is a great value. They know that we're transparent with what we do, uh, and that's why we're the largest airline in the country with uh, the top brand ranking. Over 4,000 departures a day? Yes. And how many planes in the fleet right now? Uh, we'll end next year with 750. We're just going through a retirement phase with the Classic, so we'll end this year a little over 700. What is the Classic 737 anymore? Because it ain't the 100 or the 200. That's the 300. Okay, just double check it. Yeah. Okay. But can you get to that another 500 planes? Oh, yeah, I think we can. We'll end next year with 750. As, as we talked earlier, it's one of the largest fleets in the world, all Boeing 737. I think with just the current business model, looking at North America, we have 100 destinations today. I think there are 50 more that, were, that are within scope for us. Same equipment. Uh, it may take us a generation uh, to add um, uh, 500 flights and 50 more uh, destinations. Uh, and, you know, gosh, with 500 more flights, I guess we'd be up 
uh, 7,000 uh, flights a day. So it's already a very large airline. You asked earlier whether it's, it's too big. I think that we'll need to continue to invest in the kinds of tools and technologies to manage that kind of scale. Uh, but uh, we're managing it very well today and we're preparing ourselves for that kind of growth in the future. What's your metric for going into a new market? Because sitting in your chair in your office in Dallas, I can think of about 150 different mayors who are going in there and begging you to fly to their cities. And, and what, a, what a compliment. You know, we're very grateful for the fact that people want us. Uh, we added Cincinnati this year and it was... Uh, but that was a perfect storm for you because it's an underserved city and overpriced. And, and, that, and that's what we look for. We look for those kinds of opportunities. Um, and low costs, again, are what enable this. Low costs relative to uh, our competition. Uh, the fact that we've got uh, the largest network in the country to build upon uh, and we offer great service. So that those, those are the opportunities we look for, underserved, overpriced. But even if uh, in today's environment where the industry is a lot more mature than it was 30 years ago, there's still opportunities to go into a market if you believe you've got a competitive advantage. We can offer better service at lower prices. We'll at least share shift uh, and have, uh, again, a great opportunity to uh, uh, expand the market as well. Well, there was a recent University of Virginia study, the Southwest Effect, if you will, where they went in there over a period of 20 years and actually were able to prove that when you go into a market, the fares do go down. So here you are on the verge of going, well, hey, <laughs> somebody had to confirm it. But now you're going into Hawaii. Are you ready to make a statement that when you go to Hawaii, the fares to Hawaii are absolutely. coming down? Absolutely, absolutely. We'll, everywhere we go, we bring more flights, great service, and lower fares. And, um, it's good for consumers. Um, it's good for local economies. The state of and, and Tom, uh, our president, Tom Nealon, our president, was the uh, was was in Hawaii and met the governor, and they are so excited to have us because they know that that's what's going to happen. It'll and be you'll good be feeding for the that state from California. Hawaii. Exactly, we'll have nonstop flights from California, and the 737 Max 8 will do the mission. Was the turning point for you in terms of your expansion the repeal of the Right Amendment? I don't know that that was a turning point per se, and, and again, um, you just put all this in perspective, and, and, and 31 years for me, we have never had the array of opportunities to expand like we do right now. Had the right amendment repeal not gone through, we would have expanded somewhere else, is my point. Um, but it has allowed for better service to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, lower fares, more flights, more people are flying. I think everybody wins. So that, that was certainly a big milestone, but that's just one of many. Uh, but with or without the, the right amendment, you're still point to point. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, and, 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 and Dallas is um, in our top 10 cities in terms of daily departures, uh, but, uh, the, the, you know, the company is well beyond uh, just Dallas in terms of service. and. To this day, absolutely, we, uh, we fly on a point-to-point -point basis. Can we talk about a possible mythical story, the napkin? Sure. Back in 1971? Yeah. Did that really happen? Well, the, Peter. The, the story that we're talking about, of course, is the birth of Southwest Airlines written on the back of a cocktail napkin in some bar in San Antonio. Well, there were two people there. It was Herb Kelleher and uh, Roland King. And uh, no one has ever told me that it wasn't true. So it has to be true. <laughs> it's on the cover of one of our annual reports from 1985. It has to be true. So it does exist. <laughs> well, or a facsimile there. Ah, uh, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Is there a place, I remember sitting in Mr. Kelleher's office, well, it was a, it was a hangar, um, one early morning where he said to me, under no circumstances would he ever fly to Denver, and under no circumstances would he ever fly to LaGuardia, and as we saw with former uh, Vice President Joe Biden describing it as a third world airport, some third world airports were insulted by that. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> am I speaking the truth? <laughs> uh, you're now flying to both those airports. Yeah. Well, I never asked for Herb's uh, approval on that because <laughs> I never would have gotten it uh, when we flew in there. But, you know, we, we, we and I, uh, I say that in jest, we got to a point in the early 2000s where we were the largest airline in the country. And um, we were looking forward to uh, continuing to grow. So we would talk to our customers in Chicago and say, why don't, or potential customers, why don't you fly Southwest Airlines? So, well, it's really easy. You don't go where I want to go. 
You don't fly to Minneapolis, you don't go to Boston, you don't go to Washington, D.C., you don't go to New York City. So if we were going to continue on our quest to bring Southwest to more and more places, uh, we had to uh, overcome that. And it's worked well for us. I think um, what Southwest did in the first 30 years served it well. And now we've been able to evolve a bit where we can focus more on a city and say, and not just a city pair, and say, what else can we do to win customers in that city and leverage the investment we already have? And Hawaii is a perfect example. We're the number one airline in California, any way you look at it. And uh, what would Californians like? Well, we'd love to fly southwest to other places that we want to go, and, and uh, Hawaii is a very important destination. But that's a crowded market. It's a crowded market, and we're going to do very well. Going back to that conversation with Mr. Keller, he, he told me the reasons why he would never fly to Denver or LaGuardia. He said those are the two airports that were singularly or both majorly responsible for the entire system delay at your, airport, at your airline. Are they still? Well, Denver is an interesting uh, a quick case study. Of course, we did fly to Denver uh, you, in the 1980s, out, as you yeah. know. And I don't remember how long we were there, but it wasn't very long. It was uh, more than one year, but, uh, but not very long. And, and, and Herb shut that down because of the delays. Then it was, that was Stapleton Airport, and it was replaced by Denver International. It was fresh construction, very high cost, and it just didn't work with our business model. So time goes by, the costs come down, and now Denver is a very, very um, a logical point on our system. It's in our top 10, it's bigger than Dallas. We're in the 220 daily departures range, uh, the number one airline there by far. So it is a huge success. But it does illustrate the example that, you were, that we were talking about earlier. We add Denver to our route map, and it takes us a while to convince people in Denver that we need to be their favorite airline. But in the meantime, all of our loyal customers in Chicago, in California, in Texas, in Baltimore say, oh, now my favorite airline flies to Denver. I love to go to Denver for summer, for winter, whatever it might be. And you know, 10 years later, we just have a raging success. All right, that's Denver. Shall we discuss LaGuardia? LaGuardia is different because it's so constrained, and uh, the demand here far outstrips the supply. Uh, so it's just now it's a matter, it's a different game. It's a well, it's matter slots. of getting, yeah, slots and real estate, uh, both. So uh, I think we're at about 44 daily departures here. They're very successful. It's the top market uh, in the country, and we're the largest airline in the country. So it's an important um, part of our route system, but we're mostly bringing Southwest customers to New York City as opposed to being in a position where we can win a whole lot of new customers here. We have a, a lot of fans here, don't get me wrong, right. but it's more of a destination market uh, with uh, only 44 dailies. You're here because you need to be here. And, well, and want to be here. You know, once, and we talked about this, once we pick a market, we want to be the hometown airline. Uh, and we work very hard to serve the community and be a part of the community, and uh, we don't do this it's kind of like a, it's a marriage, it's a commitment. We want to be there and uh, we, we, want to, we want to do a good job. You know, we talk about everybody knocking on your door to, to beg you to fly there, but you're not adding that many new routes every year. Well, we're growing at a pace. You know, we're growing at roughly 15 to 20 units a year. It's been a very, uh, there was a lost decade, as you know, after 9-11, and the industry suffered mightily. So uh, I think we at Southwest are trying to be steady as she goes. Um, not get over our skis here in terms of expanding. Uh, and, uh, you know, as an example, uh, we, we ran um, out of capacity with uh, pilot training facilities. So we had a 10 bay facility with 10 simulators in that, and now we've added a $250 million uh, uh, project to expand that to 18 positions and 18 simulators. Uh, just as one example. So we need to be wise about how we go about this. We want to be safe. We want to offer a great product. Uh, we want to add the right people uh, into Southwest Airlines. And, um, you know, even with that, we'll be hiring about 8,000 people this year. I think our jobs are up about 20,000 over the past five years. So um, it is growth, uh, and it is meaningful, and it's just uh, something that we want to manage carefully. And now we're on the threshold of a, of a tax bill. Right Very before exciting. Congress, yes, uh, where the, the corporate tax is going to get down to maybe 21, 22 percent. Uh, I saw all the videos of all the meetings prior to this, where they were asking CEOs 
how many of you are going to reinvest that money and create jobs? I only saw three hands go up, but your hand went up. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's overdue. It's very welcome. Um, it, it will rationalize the transportation industry relative to other industries, level that playing field. Right now, the current scheme, uh, we're a full taxpayer, and uh, many industries effectively pay 20 to 25 percent. Uh, that will lower our cost of capital relative to uh, other industries and be very, very welcome. Certainly it helps position the United States to be more competitive around the world, but as it pertains to us, puts us in a position where we're already growing, where we think we can think about growing faster and investing in more airplanes, hiring, hiring more people. Secondly, it puts us in a position to think about modernizing our fleet faster. There's a pretty significant difference between our oldest airplane and the new MAX 8. Um, well, so your we'll original 7.3s had a range of, what, 1,100 miles? The, the 200s did. And, and today? And now we're 4,000 miles. So it's, uh, and it's 15% more fuel efficient, 40% quieter. So it's just a game changer in terms of the technology available to us. We'll have more capital to be able to do that. We can share those, uh, those tax savings with our employees. We can share those tax savings with our customers by keeping our fares under control and also share it with our shareholders. It's good all the way around. Now my social media question of the day. Oh, wow. Oh, you like it because uh, you've seen it and you've all seen it and you've all seen it more than once. Uh, we're talking about optics and image, the doctor being hauled off the plane in Chicago, right? That, that really resonated with a lot of people, right? It was all about overbooking in that particular situation. What were the, well, and, and policy, right? What were the lessons that you learned at Southwest from that? Well, anytime anything like that happens, we're going to look in the mirror and, and look at what we're doing and just make sure that um, we're not susceptible to the same kind of mistake. And so we'll always do that. Uh, we're very humble at Southwest Airlines. We're always looking for ways to get better. So what that's about overbooking? One. Well, and, and then secondly, I mean, the next thing that we did is in terms of um, uh, just avoiding the whole circumstance, um, we had studied, in fact, it's, uh, we had a management training a leadership development function within Southwest, and we had a class proposed to us a decade ago eliminating uh, overbooking. And overbooking in and of itself isn't an issue. It's when more people show up uh, than you have seats and you're in a denied boarding situation. So it really is two different things. Yeah. And it just, it felt at the time that it was too costly. So time goes by, uh, Andrew Watterson, our EVP uh, over commercial, got comfortable with the sort of the business case. And then of course, employees, the last thing we want to do is oversell a flight. And so uh, we made a very quick decision that, you know, it's time to stop uh, uh, overbooking. And we've seen our denied boardings go down, Andrew, by what, 75%? Uh, so we'll, occasionally we'll still have some uh, denied boarding situations, but they're very, very, very minor. It's just the right thing to do for customers. Before we get to questions from the audience, I'm going to ask you to take off your CEO hat and put on your passenger hat and tell me the one thing as a passenger you actually hate about your own airline that you want to change. I can't. I, we are the love airline. Oh, stop. Come on. <laughs> and there's not one thing that I hate about Southwest Airlines. However, uh, uh. However, we can always get better, and I think the immediate opportunity and what's really fun for us is uh, just to take full advantage of the digital age. A lot has happened since the iPhone was introduced in 2007, and we haven't fully caught up to that. We it, can it's get, the flow of information. It's the, the, first of all, there's just so much information, and the information is available to almost everyone, employees and customers, so I think we have huge opportunities to better enable our employees with better information, accurate information at the right time, uh, and the same uh, goes with our uh, customers. So we, Tom uh, and his, one of his strategy teams led a, an initiative at Dallas Love Field just on basic wayfinding and uh, just vastly improved information. And employees loved it. They had fewer questions from customers. Customers loved it because they had the information they need in very basic things. Your flight is boarding in 10 minutes uh, at, at the right place at the right time in the airport. So I think there's huge opportunities there. And speaking of boarding, for those people who have been in boarding group C, uh, my question is, is that working? It's working fabulously. And um, 
There are no second class seats on Southwest Airlines, so it doesn't really matter what boarding group you're in, you're gonna get you a good seat. Right, no upgrades either. Well, you, you know, what, what, how much more upgraded can you be, you know, than, than Southwest? I'm not going there, okay. <laughs> but the bottom line is, you did that 10, it's hard to believe you did that 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, the, the boarding change was 10 years ago and the project that Tom led as well. He did the research, led the research, to evaluate whether customers really wanted us to change to assign seats, and two to one, they said, no, we, we like the open seating. We just hate your boarding process, so we fixed that. I think we've got the best boarding process in the industry. Last question for me, and this goes back to the flow of information from a media perspective. How do you get ahead of the story anymore? Because everybody's got a cell phone. Everybody's a citizen journalist. It goes viral instantaneously. Do you have a team of people at Southwest who are monitoring social media? We, we do. Uh, Linda Rutherford is here and was the genius behind uh, this. But we have a, um, a place we call our listening center. And it is monitoring social media all day long. They know how to engage. They know the right protocols. Uh, we try to handle customer issues right then and there. Uh, and we have an array of functions uh, within the company that are part of that group. But, uh, but you're right, I mean, we'll, we'll learn about things in the listening center, perhaps before uh, an on-the-ground station leader in you know, City X might, might learn about that. It's just so fast, uh, and I think it's proved to be invaluable. Okay, one last question, I lied. Whatever happened to the fifth of Chivas? Well, um, I, was, I was in high school then, I remember, so I, I don't know about drinking in those years. And, um, <laughs> So uh, for one week, we were the largest distributor of liquor in the state of Texas because of this promotion. <laughs> and that was apparently not uh, legal at the time, so <laughs> the, the state of Texas shut us down. But, uh, you know, the story lives on. But that was, a, that was a, um, a fair war with Braniff. And they came in and, and uh, had a, I think it was a, at the time, it was a $13 fare. And our Wait a minute, uh, I paid Lamar I Hughes was our president at the time and said, you know, no lousy airline is going to shoot us out of the air for a lousy $13 and fly on Southwest and we'll give you a fifth of booze. And uh, it worked. <laughs> so, imagine that. <laughs> Probably worked today too. <laughs> it, it might. But a fair war is really an opportunity for one airline to see who can lose money longer. Yeah, and that's where low costs become really important. And that's, uh, of course, a testament to our 44 your uh, track record of profits. Well, Gary, let's open this up to the floor. If you've got a question, I just appreciate. We have some microphones. Yes, uh, we'd appreciate if you just identify yourself and <clears throat> ask Gary your question. Don't be shy. There's a question. Oh, look who's going to ask. This is not fair. Oh no, we don't want this question. <laughs> so, Gary, I, I know you're, you're thinking I'm going to ask the Airbus question. I'm not going to ask the Airbus <laughs> question. Well, I don't I, know what it's going to be then. <laughs> I, I'm retiring shortly. I'm giving up on asking that question. Um, my, my more serious question is uh, the FAA, or more strictly speaking, air traffic management. So here in New York, uh, the TRACON is about 50% undermanned because nobody will come to live here and work in the TRACON. Uh, the FAA administrator, terrific though he is, is retiring in about three or four weeks' time. Uh, the air traffic privatization or independent management organization is stalled. Are we looking at a potential crisis looming with air traffic management? Well, Barry, first of all, thank you for a magnificent career. Congratulations on your retirement. <laughs> uh, we're going to miss you in the business, but uh, I know we'll continue to uh, see you. But, um, well, you know, we want to grow. Uh, we've been talking about that. We have opportunities to grow, and there are, there are constraints. Um, we have company constraints like how many airplanes can we get, how many people can we hire and train and deploy safely, et cetera. And then uh, from a macro perspective, we've got to have airport capacity, then we're going to have to have uh, air capacity. Uh, there's a path to, um, even here at LaGuardia, there's a path to creating more capacity at most airports. Uh, and Southwest has a long history of going into a market, lowering fares, increasing the traffic, and having to build more capacity at the airport. We can do it, we know how to do that, it works. Uh, and there's uh, billions of dollars of projects going on around the country. I'm not nearly as enthusiastic about the prospects of increasing the capacity in the air. I don't see that we're making any progress. Uh, we think that we've got the best idea um, in terms of the Airlines for America with 
the privatization? Um, the privatization sort of implies commercialization, but we just creating a not for non not for profit, <coughs> excuse me, uh, entity that would have a board of directors governing it and have the ability to finance long live projects uh, appropriately. Uh, and then also just to manage uh, the projects better. So that's, that's the idea. If somebody has a better idea, I would love to hear it because all I care about is getting the air traffic control system modernized. Um, Scott's a pilot and can uh, tell you and uh, tell uh, fir firsthand, um, you know, the deficiencies that we have with not utilizing existing technology today. Uh, it's just more time in the air. Uh, it burns more gas, more greenhouse emissions. Uh, it takes longer today to get from A to B than it did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and that's what I would worry about, that it's safe, but it just gets, it absorbs more and more and more of the available uh, time and airspace. So um, we'll look forward to having a new administration at the FAA. Uh, the White House is behind this uh, modernization uh, idea and proposal. Uh, we have a real champion uh, in the uh, House, in uh, 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 Chairman Bill Schuster, uh, who has that as a very high priority. So we actually have more progress than ever towards getting to a, a governance solution, uh, but I would agree, it's just not over the goal line yet. Obviously, Washington's uh, focused, uh, as they should be right now, on tax reform, and I'm hopeful that they'll get back on uh, to this uh, topic along with broader infrastructure questions in the first quarter of next year. Although, Gary, you know, you talk about next gen. They've been talking about next gen for how many gens? 30 years. Yeah. 30 years. Uh, Herb Kelleher was on a, on, a, on a commission. Maybe others in the room were on a commission back in 1993 in the, in the uh, Clinton administration. So we've been talking and talking and talking about this. Uh, we've uh, uh, outfitted our, our cockpits with up-to-date uh, next-gen uh, avionics. Well, you've got better avionics in the cockpit than some of the air traffic controllers. Well, they use paper uh, strips to attract uh, the flights, you know, so we, we have a long way to go, and, and Barry, you're right. I think one of the more low-tech practical outcomes is it is hard to train people on the old procedures. It's hard to maintain these old systems, and quite frankly, people don't want those jobs. And we're seeing air traffic delays simply because the air traffic controller positions are not fully staffed. So it is, um, it's, I'm a, I fear this is going to become more and more uh, of an acute problem. So we're going to keep after it. Gary, hi. Why shouldn't the, the GA people be concerned about privatization? Obviously, that's one of the primary reasons why it's not gotten through so far, because of the strong lobby. And there's a, it's epidemic through GA that they're going to be diminished, if not eliminated. So would you speak to that, please? Absolutely. Um, well, I think there, you know, the, the industry has in its history an effort to shift cost to the business jet community and, and general aviation. And so I think that uh, that is a fear that that community has. And that won't work. You know, so I think uh, that the, the current leadership in the industry, uh, the commercial airline industry, understands that. Uh, so does Chairman Schuster. So we have done everything we know to guarantee that the cost structure will not change for uh, GA. So I think that's number one. But what I would, uh, so I think that's the primary issue. There, there are some other issues too, Ken. But I think the primary thing that we should all be concerned about is what I was describing. Uh, if, you just, if you can't fly where you want to fly because there's not capacity, then that hurts everyone. Um, and, you, and, and plus, just from a, the country's perspective, you wouldn't want to disadvantage the vast majority of the population who is dependent upon commercial aviation to travel uh, for the smaller numbers of folks that want to uh, you know, access general aviation. So I think there's a number of reasons why we ought to be open-minded about doing this, but we all should share the desire to modernize the system, to create more capacity. It's a very safe system. If we can have techniques that make it even safer, why wouldn't we want to do that? And the evidence is clear. We are going nowhere fast, even after 30, 30 years throwing billions of dollars at this, um, 
And uh, every day, the skies uh, get uh, less and less efficient. Thank you. Uh, Milan Skolnik at ICF. Could you give us an update on your aircraft financing and how you are planning to finance your uh, order book between cash, capital markets, uh, lending and leasing, and some proportions of all those? Sure, sure, Thank absolutely. You. Well, we've come through um, uh, a, a significant phase led by uh, Mike Vandeman, our chief operating officer, to uh, renew our fleet. And we just uh, retired, as we were referring earlier, um, Mike, I think we retired 87 uh, classic airplanes in 2017 and have, uh, will have replaced all of those uh, with uh, certainly newer equipment and in many cases brand new airplanes uh, by the time we get to uh, roughly mid-year um, 2018. Uh, we, have, we, we carry about $3 billion in cash as a liquidity target. Right now, our debt uh, to total capital is very modest. It's about a third. Uh, we're hopeful that we'll uh, ultimately be A-rated by all the uh, credit rating agencies. So it's a very high quality investment grade uh, balance sheet, uh, as you all know. Um, I believe on a net debt basis uh, for 2017 that it was zero. In other words, I, I th if, by my memory, I think uh, whatever financings we did uh, we're simply paying off debt uh, that was maturing. We may have been a little bit of a, a net debt increase for 2017. But uh, we're pretty well uh, self-financed during these kinds of times. Tax reform would put us in an even better position uh, to uh, manage our balance sheet going forward. Um, it, when we access the uh, used market, we'll often um, uh, access leased aircraft, but for the most part, we, we haven't relied on the uh, leasing market, uh, certainly in recent years, uh, to, for our financing. But uh, we'll, you know, probably be, um, Chris is over here somewhere, maybe half a billion dollars per year, more or less, in terms of financing requirements, uh, and that is mostly to refinance, refinance our debt. Cash flow from operations is very strong, uh, so we're in a very good position to uh, self-finance here, uh, certainly for the for the near term. So if you want more Southwest paper, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Peter, Gary, thank you very much. That was outstanding. Thank you all very much for having us. Pleasure. Thank you.